So where are you from? Yeah, I'm I'm about an hour away, Western Maryland. So Western, how yeah. far Western? Um, are you familiar with Maryland a little bit? I was born <clears throat> in D.C. Went to elementary school in West, in Rockville, junior high school and high school in Bethesda. Okay. Worked for a summer job in Gaithersburg. <clears throat> right, we used to live there. And uh, with Bechtel, my mom was with IBM out there. We commuted every day to my junior summer. So I'm familiar with the area. Oh. Frederick, Maryland, playing soccer for my high school team. There you go. Walter Johnson. So I'm sort of familiar. And I got a, my wife's <clears throat> got a cousin in Frostburg, which is way out of right. the panhandle. Well, that's not too far from where we are. Mm -hmm. um, I <clears throat> used to live in Frederick as well. I went to Walkersville, um, if you're familiar with that. Um, but yeah, just kind of like always like we started in Gaithersburg and migrated up to like Western Maryland. Sort of head of the wave of suburban right. or something yeah. like that. Yeah, so I've kind of just grown up here. I used to live in Miami for a little while. Um, <clears> so that was like completely different than what's here. But yeah. Well, at least you got the heat and humidity and gnats up here too, right? Right, right. At least for the summer. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, thank you um, so much for, <clears throat> for your time, uh, Don. Um, for those people listening in and don't know about you, would you mind just um, sharing a little bit about the work that you do? And sure. Well, I was, uh, like I mentioned, I, I was trained as a chemical engineer. Uh, one of my fraternity brothers who also played basketball, in college where I played basketball at Lehigh University, went to medical school. So I thought that would be an interesting thing to explore. So I took some biology classes, decided I'll go into medicine. Uh, I was a little late deciding that, so I had to take a year off. So I worked at NIH as a chemical engineer. And then I went to Georgetown Medical School, decided to be a family medicine doc. And because the internal medicine and pediatric residencies pretty much had it locked down on the eastern part of the country. I went to Sacramento, I matched to Sacramento to do family medicine. That's where I was exposed to the Permanente Medical Group and the Kaiser Permanente Program. Went to work for them in 1978. And I worked with them for a little over 30 years and uh, got interested in preventive medicine early where they were doing a multiphasic where people would come in and get tested and then two weeks later have a total physical with the nurse practitioner. And we were doing about 25,000 a year. And uh, but then got into more traditional medicine, adult medicine practice. I was in charge of a family medicine department and a clinic with 65 docs. And then in 2006, as I was thinking about retirement, uh, read the China study. And my wife and I became went, went on more of a whole plant diet. And then three months later, Neil Barnard came to speak with his book on reversing type 2 diabetes. And I met Neil and read the book and started using it with patients and things start getting better. And then the docs around me said, well, what are you doing? And I told him, I said, well, give us a talk on it. So I started doing the literature and it was, uh, it's buried in there. Uh, the one article that sticks out in my mind. So this is 2006, seven, I'm starting to give talks. I come across this crane and sample article. It was done in Auburn, which is right up the street from Sacramento. And it used to be a TB asylum, but now it's a Seventh-day Adventist sort of plant-based intervention program where people live. And they took 21 patients and they put them on whole plant diet, no, no refined products, exercise 30 minutes a day. They had peripheral distal neuropathy for three and a half years, and they had had diabetes for almost 11. Okay. 17 of the 21 people had no more neuropathy in 16 days. That's and I'm incredible. looking at this article and I'm going, are you kidding me? This is right up the street. And these are the people I'm pushing drugs on. And this is a possibility. I, I don't know if they're going to do it. Gosh knows they're not getting the support from our education department to do any of this stuff. But I got to give them an option. You know, at least know it's out there. So you come across enough. Like, then you get into the arterial diseases with Ornish and Esselstyn. And talks lead to talks. And then I get asked to sort of help John McDougall, I forget how that happened, but helped get a bill through Northern California. So I start going to meet John and start going to his advanced study weekends. And then uh, he asked me to start helping him take care of the Whole Foods employees that come through for their corporate program. Now they do CenturyLink as well. I believe he was featured in Forbes magazine for um, helping to cut back on the health care costs. Yeah, that's an interesting article. Uh, yeah, CenturyLink they said they had a return on the investment of one to seven to one. I don't know what that means. I know what a one to seven return yeah. is or a seven to one. Or I, I've got to ask the vice president of that company what it exactly means. But basically, they're paying for people to come live there for eight days. The McDougal program is 10 days. 
Eight days. So uh, it's expensive. You're living at the Flamingo Resort, which is very acceptable and it's a nice place, uh, but it's an older resort and you're given breakfast, lunch, and dinner buffets. And we provide medical care. So my job on the first day is take people off their blood pressure and hypertensive medications for the most part. And then by the end of the week, they're better than when they came in. But it is sort of interesting because the social milieu and the environment people are in make a big difference as to how they act and how well they're able to continue changing the lifestyle, which is, you know, 90% diet. Right. Uh, so then they go back to their original environment. It's very hard to maintain sometimes. We had one interesting patient in Century Link. Uh, came in. She was on four diabetic medicines. And with diabetes, it's a sugar or glucose processing problem, but it's nothing to do with carbohydrates. It's in your diet. Nothing whatsoever. Right. Walter yeah. Kempner was curing diabetes with white rice in the 40s. Right. Anderson put people in a metabolic ward chamber and fed them carbohydrates and sugar, and they got better. And people go, what? It's the fat in your diet and the fat on your body. Because if you eat fat, it interferes with your insulin, gets in your bloodstream. And if you have over fat, it spills fat into your bloodstream. Yeah, so tell us, uh, I want to talk to you about type 2 <clears throat> diabetes. So kind of break it down for people who are not aware of like the science. What is going on with type 2 diabetes? Okay. We can get involved in the reductionistic science. But if you were to come into me with type 2 diabetes, I'm going to say, look, it's the fats in your diet and the fats on your body. That's it. we got to get you to get the fat out of your diet, which we can do fairly quickly. We can send you to McDougal. We can do, that's prison light, by the way. You know where prison heavy is? What's that? It's right down the street from McDougal. It's Alan Goldhammer's shop. Oh, right, right. Water. Water fasting, yeah. Yep. Medically I, supervised water fasting. Yeah. Well, I'm more aware than you because last year I went there for two weeks and did nine days of water. Oh, did you? How was that? Uh, I wasn't hungry, which was amazing because I love food. Uh, there were people there who were hungry. I lost 17 and a half pounds. Gosh. Uh, I didn't have any problems. All you're doing is resting. I met some very interesting people there. Yeah. Henry Grossman, who's a f photographer who took all the iconic Beetle and JFK pictures. Oh, and that's stuff cool. Like. So there's very interesting people there, about yeah. 50 or 60 people, and they round on you three times a day. And the total bill for 15 days I had a private room was about only about $3,700. That includes medical care because you have to complete. But these doctors and nat naturopaths there have experience taking care of people. That's prison heavy. So if people need to, if they can do stuff on their own at home, go for it. Go on whole plant diet. Uh, True North is SOS. Salt, oil, oil and, and sugar, sugar free, right. right? Yeah, right. So it's whole plant foods, salt, oil, and sugar free. Uh, Jeff Novick, who's a good personal friend, who's, I don't know if you know Jeff. Yeah, definitely. Registered dietitian. He says you've got to cut out the crap. CRAP, concentrated, refined, and processed. So for people with type 2 diabetes, fat out of your diet, fat off your body. So the key concept for fat out of your diet is just get fat out of your right, diet. Right, cut it out. So vegetables, fruits, starches, complex carbohydrates, right. potatoes, sweet potatoes, beans. Because they're not the enemy. They're good for you. Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're, they're fat free. There's very little fat. Right. In a, in a recipe. Regardless okay. of the carbohydrates, because of their fat content so low, mm -hmm. it's actually mm -hmm. healthy for people to kind of reduce their fat intake with those foods. It has plenty of fiber, which helps in the regulation. And what John talked to me about, any starch below ground is a complete nutritional source. Oh, Are you talking need, about like potatoes and... Turnips. Right. Sweet right. potatoes. They're complete nutritional sources. All you need is B12. Right. If it's a starch above ground, like wheat, rice, corn... You need a little vitamin A, a little vitamin C. Right. There a little you go. broccoli. Right. A little, you get it. You know, your body is a complex system that takes what it needs when it needs it. Right. From what do you give it? So you don't optimize. I have a couple pet peeves just to let you know. One is optimal diet. I don't know what the heck that means. <laughs> your complex system, you don't optimize a complex system. That's the height of egotistical mania with humans who think they're it's in very control. reductionist yeah exactly right. exactly so you t you just intervene to a complex system and it gives you outputs right right you can't optimize it it's just too complicated for that you just live with the results now 
you can optimize one aspect of it and kill it. So let's say you're a diabetic and you're on diabetic medication. Okay. And we put you, you, you get your oils out of your diet. It's fast right. out of your diet. Whoosh, hypoglycemia and dead. I just killed you while I was feeding you the right foods. So what happened there? Well, so what you do when I'm at McDougal is we take them off the medications on day one so they don't get a problem. Gotcha. So the medication can actually be a problem if you transition to the diet and you have to take them off, right. correct? exactly. Yeah. And most doctors don't have the experience of taking people off meds. Right. But you can tell the patients, you can give them a run chart like I'm going to talk about tomorrow where they record their times over, you know, their fasting sugars in the morning over time and say, look, if it drops to a certain level, we want to stop. But the reality is that people don't die from diabetes. They die from the complications. So the way McDougal treats diabetes, he never gives them pills. He always gives them long-acting insulin shots if they need it. But the reality is if you send people home with fasting sugars of 300, they're spilling sugars into their urine and it's helping them lose weight. So right. it's getting the fat off their body quickly. So to get fat off your body, you, you need calorie density concept, which mm -hmm. is Jeff Novick's concept. And you can actually look at his video called Calorie Density, Eat More, Live, Eat More, Weigh Less, and Live Longer. It's a, now it's available YouTube video right. for free. And it's the central organizing concept about how people lose weight. There's good news and bad news. I don't know why people gain weight over 40 years and think they can lose it in a month, but a half to three quarters of a pound is probably a realistic goal for people to lose weight. They just have to follow low-calorie, dense foods. Uh, and you have to understand and, and work with the diets and the, the way they eat at home within their home environment. But you also uh, have to explain to them that the most common vegetable consumed in the United States, which is a French fry, uh, is not a potato. It's a very healthy russet potato at 486 calories per pound, which has been dipped in 4,000 calories per pound oil right. and turned into a 1,786 calorie per pound French fry. So the calorie density goes up. Exactly. Right. When you add oil to something. Just like when you add vegetables to a dish, it always goes down because, you know, it's just vegetables are 100 calories per pound. You will starve to death on vegetables. You consume three to five calorie five pounds of food a day. That's what humans do. Right. You do it constantly over time. I do it constantly over time. It may vary from three and a half for you to four and a half to me, but we do that over time. So if you eat less calories per pound and you're eating a fixed amount of poundage, your calories go down. So the best study I, I use in my, some of my talks when I have time, more than I have this week, but uh, is the Shintani study, which was a Hawaii, one of his Hawaiian studies where they took Hawaiians on a traditional American diet, 32% fat, 2,600 calories a day, you know, Put them on a traditional Hawaiian diet, mm -hmm. which is taro sweet potato paste. Told them to eat ad libitum, eat when you're hungry. And they did. And they dropped their daily calorie intake by 1,000 calories a day. They went from 2,600 to 1,600. And oh they weren't hungry. Right. Ad libitum diet, no calorie restriction, high protein, low carb. You can lose weight on that, but for some very interesting reasons metabolically, but it's not the healthiest way to eat. So uh, for your diabetics, it's Fat out of the diet, fat off the body. Right. And if, they, if they're lean like you are and they're type 2 diabetic, you know, get fat out of the diet. Their insulin's going to work better. If their sugars are running high, you can give them a little long-acting insulin if they want. But if not, you know, you can – because it, when you intervene correctly in a complex system, most of the unanticipated side effects you get or unanticipated consequences are positive. Right, right. Cholesterol gets better. Your blood pressure gets better. And there's a big difference between normal and healthy. Normal is set by the medical industry. I mean, diabetes used to be above 150 fasting sugars, 150 milligrams. They dropped it down to 125 over time, and then they invented prediabetes. And below 100 is normal. I don't even know what a healthy blood sugar is. I know what a healthy blood pressure is. It's more like 15, 1010, you know, over about 60, 65. That's healthy. If you look at populations around the world who eat good food, Maybe little animal products, but generally plants, Most and are very plants. active. Mm -hmm. That's what they run. Their pressures don't go up over time. The pressures only go up over time if, let's see, what's the thought experiment I use? Okay, so you're a heart. Okay, you know, okay. you're a heart. All yeah. right. What's your job? Pump blood, right? That's your job. Right. You got 75,000 miles of pipes to pump through. And you're doing your job. You're a young heart. You're a five-year-old heart. 
all of a sudden, it's getting harder to pump. Something's clogging up the works. You don't know what's going on downstream, but what's your normal response? Pump harder. Raise your pressure. Right. So the pressure raises, and things still get popped up. And then some guy comes along, gives you a pill that lowers your pressure. Does that change your job? Well, it no. makes it harder for me, I think. makes it harder. So you're going to go back. You're going to try and make it higher. So then you come back to your diet. Well, it's not quite working. So we'll give you a second type of drug in a different class. But the doctors tend to over-treat blood pressure. Like John McDougall won't treat a blood pressure unless it's above 160 over 100 on a consistent basis. Yeah, like really high. Stage two. Yeah. You wouldn't treat stage one because there's been no studies that show it's advantageous. But one in 12 people will have harm. And that's even using a diuretic, which is a great first-line drug. <clears throat> so the doctors are pushing pills, they're pushing combination pills and stuff like that. And it's just not the right approach. Lifestyle is always said is the first step, but nobody does that because nobody understands or works in the support system. Like with the Permanent Medical Group working at Kaiser, I would be teaching people low-fat diets for diabetes, and they would be taught to count the carbohydrates in the health education classes. They're still doing that. And I want to ask you, why do you think like um, carbohydrates got like such a bad name for them and started um, I mean, most people recommending like to limit their carbohydrates when it comes to diabetes? Like where do you think all that m misconception came from? That's an interesting question. Uh, Michael Greger, who, you know, I work uh, you know, on the website, I work on the board, I volunteer on the board of nutritionfacts.org. He wrote a book called Carbophobia. And the answer may be buried in there. I think it just makes intuitive sense to people that if it's an elevated sugar, it's got to be a sugar problem. Gotcha. And it's always easy to point the blame at a food like sugar or you know, whatever it's going to be. <clears throat> people are always looking for excuses to eat what they'd like to eat. Uh, so I'm not sure that I know the exact answer how it is, but well, it clearly is. But people, what people don't understand, even John McDougall's book on the starch solution doesn't go into details, is carbohydrates are carbohydrates, which means they're carbons, ox hydrogens, and oxygen in a specific ratio. Starches are just long glucose molecules. Your amylase in your saliva and your pancreatic pancreas puts out amylase, cuts that up. It's your primary fuel. Every cell in the body burns glucose. Right. Your brain prefers it. Table sugar is a molecule of glucose and a molecule of fructose. Fructose is only metabolized by the liver into fats, triglycerides, uric acid, which predisposes to gout and also raises blood pressure, interestingly enough, and inflammatory aldehydes, which causes inflammation in the liver and is a leading source of cirrhosis in the country now. But fructose is not a bad substance. It's in fruit. <clears throat> Correct. Right. So glucose is about 70 on the sweetness scale. Fructose is about 160, and table sugar is about in the middle. So fructose doesn't suppress your appetite, and it's low glycemic. So, and it's twice as sweet, two and a half times as sweet as glucose. So you're a food manufacturer, and you have a sugar that's two and a half times as sweet as something it doesn't suppress appetite. Right. This is a perfect thing to add to your food. Because you want more. High fructose corn syrup is really just 60-40 instead of 50-50. It's not all that much different. <clears throat> so the calorie density is the key organizing thing. Then there are little small little nuances. Like oil doesn't necessarily, it's, it's, you're gonna, it's more calorie dense. That's a problem. But it's a double-edged sword because it also leads to passive overconsumption. So you take two sets of food with the same amount of calories, but more oil, you'll eat more of this. Salt leads to overconsumption, passive overconsumption. Take two breads that are identical, except one has more salt in it, you're going to eat more of that. Because that's just the way we work as biological okay. systems. <clears throat> so then once you tell people about the calorie density and get them figuring out and they've got to start cooking and you know how to shop for, you know, avoid things with labels and things like that, and they learn how to read this sort of stuff. Then you have to give them realistic time frames, which is about half a pound to three quarters of a pound a week, which is disturbing because, you know, they gain the weight over 30 years and they think they can lose it in three months before their sister's wedding that they have to fit into the dress or whatever, whatever, you know, gets them in. Sure. And yeah. Prochaska, who's done most of the stuff around 
behavior change and self-changing. He's a Emeritus University of Rhode Island professor who came up with with his colleagues a trans theoretical model, pre contemplation, contemplation, oh right, planning action. That's TTM. He found that his sort of epiphany, other than the fact that his father drank himself to death as he got interested in why do people do self-destructive behaviors? <clears throat> as a doctor, if you came in and you're a smoker, I'd send you to a stop smoking class. And then you didn't stop. Where would the problem be? Well, the traditional answer, of course, is the patient. Right. I mean, it gave me the information. But his approach was maybe it was the process, not the patients. Maybe that's not how people change. And that's what he studied for 40 years and published on. His book is Thriving for Good, which was a 94 book, but it's a good introduction to that whole subject. But he found, for instance, that smokers, before they've quit permanently, will quit four times that year before. They do it, and they, they recycle. Yeah. They do it, they recycle. Right. They do it, they recycle. And that's the way patients are. So they need support over time. They need support in their environment. But if they don't, if it's not based on the best available scientific evidence, they're going to be barking up the wrong tree. So I'm very clear about very quickly telling people who have diabetes, look, this is probably a reversible disease. It was clearly preventable. You have to get fat out of your diet, fat off your body. You're a point A. I would love to see you over here. But how you get from A to B, that's your journey. And let's see what we can do to make it easier. And oh, by the way, who does the cooking and shopping at your house? Because if I'm talking to a guy and he doesn't know where the kitchen is, the next visit's going to be with the wife. Right. And the first question I'll ask a wife is, he's got diabetes. That's going to cut down on his life expectancy. So he's probably going to die soon, sooner than you'd like. I'm making that assumption. Do you want to try and keep this model alive for as long as possible, or do you want to try and break in a new model? And then Vera says, no, I've got a lot of invested in this one, you know, 20 years or whatever it is. And I want to keep him around. I said, okay, this is what you got to do. The first thing is we get the fat out of the diet. And right. if you're, you're doing the cooking, you don't have to cook with olive oil. You don't have to eliminate olive oil right away, but almost all your recipes say three tablespoons. Start with one. Start with half, right. you know. Uh, and then we can teach you how to water saute, you know, those sort of tricks not tricks, they're skills. And then, oh, what are your favorite menu items? Let's see if we can make each one healthier. Exactly. Because as long as you like the food, you're going to eat it. And that's what I think it comes down to most of the time. Absolutely. You've got to love what you're eating. That's right. And there's a there's a great website uh, called Curiosity Stream. They can, like $30, you can subscribe to it for years, and like 1,500 documentaries, you know, three minutes, 10 minutes longer, you know. And one of them is called Nutrition Something, and, it, and it's the chef for the veg in Philadelphia, about half with Michael Greger, half. And the guy's talking about how you can put a carrot at the middle of your plate and make it the central portion, you know, and people, he talks about how people are wedded to be satisfied with foods, and that's such a key issue. Uh, all your spices are... Uh, plants, basically. I think since my wife and I went from vegetarian to whole food plant-based, uh, I, I don't like to use the term whole foods plant-based. It's so ingrained in my, I, I have to catch myself when I do it because it's really about whole plant foods, right? minimal salt, oil, and sugar, avoiding packaged foods. Unfortunately, I'm married to somebody who can eat half a cookie. <laughs> So she'll make 12 cookies, eat half a cookie, put one and a half in front of me, and that's not, not I'm not controlling my environment very well. Right. So, you know, the negotiations will probably continue. I'm losing that one. But all kidding aside, you know, it's not the occasional stuff yeah. that gets you in trouble. It's the day in, day out abuse. That's right. And it's like John McDougall tells a story, you know, where, okay, a guy comes in, he says, I got a headache. And before you order the CT scan, you figure you better take a history. So take a very detailed history. And you find this guy's got a very interesting habit. Hits himself over the head with a hammer every day. Hmm. And he's got a headache. And it's like, what is your next step? Do you order the CT scan to rule out some tumor or, you know, or it's like quit injuring yourself. Yeah. Put that hammer away. <laughs> right. And your body will heal itself. And it's amazing. Now, sometimes the horse is out of the barn. You know, sometimes things have gone too far downstream, you know, to put things back in. But I'm constantly amazed at the people's power to reverse 
and, pre and prevent these. The problem is there's not a lot of money in prevention, and it's hard to prove you didn't get something you would have gotten. So if we put you on a lot of this diet, you'll never get diabetes. Can we prove that? No. Do we care? Eh, not really. We had one lady in the Meals for Health program that I did in Sacramento Food Bank with the Earth Save International, John Robbins organization, Jeff Nelson's, it was the executive director. And we took care of 20 people with Food Bank. And one of them was a lady, and you can go to the Earth Save International website and uh, look at these videos for Meals for Health. And she was one of the first ones from Sacramento. Her name was Kimberly. And she had been having irritable bowel syndrome for 12 years or so, 10, 12 years, <laughs> ever since her second pregnancy. And for her, what that meant was diarrhea 11 times a day, just explosive death. I mean, her daughter always looked for her first in the bathroom and then on the couch. <clears throat> and she came in and started eating this way, and the diarrhea's gone, just fixed. Now... I can't tell you this day, and she can't tell you, was it the dairy, was it this, was it that? She doesn't care. She just wants to feel better. She's better, and she lost 40 pounds in two and a half months. I mean, it's anticipated, you know, one of those consequences of intervening correctly, you get lots of benefits. Right. So it's, uh, you start getting... I give talks to doctors about this, and I can sort of try and encourage them and do a little entertaining and give them the science. But until they start getting feedback from people and seeing it work and get the practical experience around it, because, I mean, John McDougall taught me how to do this very quickly. He just wrote, there's a one page thing. He gave the docs who came in the clinic, and I'm looking at this thing. You want me to take them off all their medicines on the first day? I mean, are you really? I mean, he said, no, don't touch psychiatric medicines, just the diabetic medicine and the blood pressure. And if they're on a beta blocker, cut it in half. That's it. But they get seen every day and the staff's very well. So that environment to, to take care of people in that environment is very safe. Right. Some of the other immersion programs like the Esselstyn program, they take care of people in groups, group of diabetics. So you're making these recommendations to people as a group and as a practicing clinician, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with that. I just don't want to hurt people. I know I can teach them the right thing to do, but, you know, the medicine profession's got them on medications, and just like it takes some skills to put people on the proper medicine, it takes some skills to take people off the medications unless you have the experience and you're working in an environment that supports it. Right. And, of course, when you go to the McDougall program for CenturyLink or Whole Foods, there are 70 or 80 people from all over the country and world, in fact, for Whole Foods that are all together. Now, they're all on their phones checking back home because the people at home are going, how's it working, how's it working? Checking it out with their social network and stuff like that. So it's been an interesting journey. Uh, but so as Jeff Novick says, he's paying penance for working for craft early in his life. I'm paying penance for pushing pills for three years. <laughs> but uh, it's not, I mean, the science is buried in there. It's been known for about 15 or 20 years. Uh, I don't know. You know, it's when you come to a conference like this to get the word out, a thousand people here, you realize that a lot of them are going to get jacked up and excited about it and they'll go back into their environment and they're going to try and implement this. Some will be more successful than others. The environments will be more conducive than others. Uh, but I come to conferences like this and I don't go to many conferences anymore because I've been teaching it for so long and I've heard so many of these people and I know most of them personally anyway. One time or another, through the McDougall Advanced Study Weekends, I don't, I, even today I learn. And even today, my wife and I, after 12 years, are still doing changes. You know, we're trying less sugars and carbohydrates. And that's pretty easy for me to do, but it's harder for her to do. Um, cooking without oils was pretty easy. Uh, and after I did True North last year, we came out with... Uh, a little better commitment for that. So it's, it's a journey. You know, right. It's a journey. I mean, I wish I'd known this well before I was 58. I'm 70 now. Uh, and I was a National C licensed soccer coach. So I was, you know, I can't tell you how many pepperoni, how many pizza parties I had for a soccer team. At the soccer game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. know how many pepperoni. I love pepperoni pizza. But uh, <laughs> What do you feel is the best way to, like, really have the message stick with the patients? Find out what's important to them. Okay. So if I, they're patient, motivator. Yeah, what, what's important to their value system? So if somebody comes in and I take a history, what sort of, what do you do for work? I don't work, but I do volunteer work. Where do you want volunteer? I want volunteer for the Humane Society. Whoa. 
that's animal rights, right? Exactly. You pull that lever, right? And Or, you know, let's say a 20-year-old comes in with a zit and it's female. I'm going, she said, I want to get rid of this. I said, well, you know, I can give you topical stuff to put on. But, you know, it's amazing to me that you put all this topical stuff on, but you're eating so that the arteries are constricted and you're not getting nutrients to your skin so they can heal itself. Right. And the oils and stuff are causing the acne. <clears throat> I mean, if I have a guy with or a lady with back acne, you know, Democrat, eliminate dairy, it goes away. Face a little tougher. Uh, Jeff Nelson's twins, Nina and Randa. I don't know if you know the Nelson sure. twins. Yeah, they're on YouTube. Yeah, they're a big YouTube person. I, you know, uh, the third Meals for Health program was overseen by Dr. Lewinda, who's in Southern California, Kaiser. And they did acne intervention program. And they have some pretty impressive videos. I mean, their, their acne was really bad. And they've been on, quote, whole food, plant-based diet for a long time. Right, right. Lean, you know, typical 21, 22 year old mm -hmm. girls, you know, beautiful, talented, that sort right. of stuff. And, but they were still doing oil and peanut butter. And they were bad. And they cleaned that up and it went away. So now a lot of people don't necessarily have to do that because there is individual variation, just like Kim Williams was talking about earlier today in his presentation. Uh, so not one size fits all. So I think you find the levers of motivations for people. Uh, and some people do it and some people won't. I mean, I've had people come up. One person talked to my neighbor. He says, oh, I saw your, your neighbor, Dr. Forrester, for a short appointment. I sprained my ankle. We got talking about this, that, and the other. He said, read the China study. Well, I read it, and now I'm eating nothing but plants. I mean, I didn't talk to the guy about it. I didn't even tailor it to Jeez. him. He just, you know, they're early adapters. Right. Those terms came out of the Iowa corn study in the 30s. So Monsanto, I think, or one of the large, were developing their own seeds. And they were trying to get the farmers to implement these new and improved seeds, right? And some of them were early adapters, and some of them were early majority and late majority and laggards. And they looked at the social characteristics, and the people who are early adapters tend to be a little better educated, have more friends. There's a whole raft of things, but suffice it to say, not everybody's going to jump off the cliff like the lemmings. You know, they just they need a little bit more reassurance. And nah, you know, that's that's the way probably it should be. You know, <clears throat> so they're early adapters and that sort of thing. But I think you can speed that up if you, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, tailor it to them, and then provide support for them over time, which might be how to cook, might be how to shop, might be. You know, how do you deal with your husband or how do you deal with your wife or, you know, because you don't want to make two meals all the time, you know. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, is Doug Lyle, who's a psychologist with Esteem Dynamics. A lot of his videos are free on his website. You said Dynamics. Dr. Lyle, right? Yeah, Dr. Yeah, Lyle. I've connected with him in the past. We um, remember doing a Skype interview with him yeah. and just got into the evolutionary um, yeah, psychology. Yeah, he's, has, It's just so fascinating. That that stuff just blows my mind. It's incredible. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it's yeah. very interesting from a physician standpoint and a perspective about looking back over what you taught because... You know, when I was going through medical school, the colon just held on to poop and absorbed water. That's all its functions were. Now we know there's thousands of bacteria and it's in the microbiome. Yeah. I don't care. I mean, I'm trying to get, I mean, because that's going to change. I mean, it doesn't make any, I mean, this isn't nuclear physics. You got all this bacteria down there, you know, thousands of species, and they're just reacting to what's coming down the pike. You put some different stuff down the pike. Certain species are going to die and some of them are going to thrive. Right. It's going to change. Was that any practical significance? Eh, it might be yeah, around the edges, but really the goal is to prevent and reverse chronic conditions. Mm -hmm. If you keep us lean and eating whole plant foods, your type 2 diabetes isn't going to exist. Uh, the last 5 or 10 pounds can be a little tricky. Sometimes people are cheating or they don't understand the calorie density of some of the foods. You know, uh, Maybe exercise. That's a little bit of a problem. Right. But I think that's that's great. I think it was Dr. Esselstyn who said um, uh, the most important, and I'm paraphrasing here, but the most important thing you give to their patients is your time. 
Yeah. Um, so I think that's that's really key and just getting to know them, going down to the real grassroots of what is important to them. Yeah, and, it, and the doctors you know, you need support over time. And, and the reason I like talking about diabetes is, you know, doctors come in. Uh, medicine's a pretty simple avocation profession. People come to you with a problem. If you make an accurate diagnosis and you give them the best treatment, things usually turn out. If you don't have a diagnosis or it's not accurate, you got problems. And if you're given the wrong treatment, you have problems. You're going to be very busy because people are going to come back. They're going to be continually sick. And you're just not going to think it works. But sometimes these things do take time. Right. Right. Um, so we've talked about type 2 diabetes. Let's touch upon type 1 because um, that's not too um, – I don't feel like that's talked enough about um i would agree yeah so let's mm. talk about that and um what what's going on with type one as opposed to type two yeah type one basically type two is you've got you're producing enough insulin it's just not working because of the fat in your diet and fat on your body type one you no longer have the capacity to make insulin which is the hormone that takes the blood glucose out of your bloodstream and into your cells so it builds up um when you look far enough upstream, type 1 diabetes is associated with dairy intake. It's theoretically possible if we could get our body off dairy in this country that there wouldn't be any more type 1 diabetes. And that happens early on, correct? If you give a child... It, it can happen later. I mean, okay. I've seen a couple of adult onsets. But, you know, here again, the food intake habits of the country have changed dramatically over the last 20 or 30 years. But it, typically, you're right, it happens in children and adolescents. Typically, when it happens, there is a type one and a half. The type one and a half is type two, but because they've had elevated sugars for so long, their pancreas is putting out all this insulin trying to get rid of it. It sort of burns itself out. So you can lose the capability of making insulin. You still make it, you just can't make as much as you need. So you have to give those people some, you know, a little long acting shot or mm -hmm. one or twice a day. So that's the distinction. Uh, my son-in-law actually has type 1, and he actually developed in his late adolescent years. Uh, but it's a, it's a tough condition. But here again, the it's an autoimmune disorder in the sense the body turns against itself and, and attacks the beta cells. And the thinking is that some of the protein that's broken down from cow's milk and absorbed is very similar to that. And if it sees this as a foreign substance attacks it, but in the process attacks the pancreas as well. So all the autoimmune disorders, the most common one is thyroid. I was going to say hypothyroidism, it sounds so similar um, to type 1 in the sense that it's an autoimmune disease and basically from the foods that people are eating, the body it confusingly attacks itself. Right. So where do you get thyroid, where do you get, where do you get animal thyroid in your diet? Right. I mean, just from the hormones and in, in the yep. hot dogs and sausages. And so in, in what, what sense? do you think Is they put in those things? They grind up everything in the animal and throw it in. Oh, so you're saying there's th um, like thyroid yeah. uh, organs mixed in there. Yeah. That's T testicles, so thyroids, right, peripheral everything. nerves. Everything except central nerves. Okay. Because of the mad cow concerns for, that was found in Britain. Mm-hmm. It's illegal to cut the brain and the spinal cord can't be chopped up and put into the meat. I didn't know that. So they autopsy, they've autopsied hot dogs and, and, and hamburgers. The distressing thing is the all meat hot dogs have no more than about 7% meat in them. And the rest but, is just organs or a lot of, there, right? <laughs> a lot of stuff. It makes you think about, well, I've never thought about that question. <laughs> you know, it's, it's intestines. Uh, there's, Plant pro there's plant fiber in there. There's okay. peripheral nerves in there. There's a lot of stuff you don't think about. You know, it's sort of like what's I was saying. You don't want to watch laws or sausages made. You know, <laughs> sort of thing. The devil's in the details. But the thought is that that's and and part of that is that those proteins can get in the body if there's high fat in the body. And when you have fat intake, the fat comes out of the intestine. At least my understanding, it goes into the lymphatics, so it bypasses the liver. Okay. If it's absorbed into the bloodstream, the portal vein takes it right into the liver, so the liver gets a crack at it, sort of detoxifies things as it's coming out. But it doesn't do that totally 100% effectively. So it's possible. It's like, uh, it's 
it's like you know, it's like uh, infectious gastroenteritis. You know, you go out, get a bad meal, get diarrhea. Mm-hmm. You can cook meat and kill the bacteria, but that doesn't necessarily kill the endotoxins that they produce in the meat. So then you eat the meat. You don't get the bacteria, but there's a little residual endotoxin that gets into the fat that gets absorbed directly into your body, and you get a little sick from it, but not that sick. So, <clears throat> you know, it's in the details. But there are about 125 autoimmune disorders, psoriasis. I was talking to a dermatologist a little while ago about it. Uh, <clears throat> lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, all those things are autoimmune. Probably nutritionally mediated. There's maybe some things that just happen, but people can get allergic to plants. You know, uh, my intestinal problems that were solved after I had some mild intestinal problems, which I was trying to fix, turned out to be walnuts. Okay, you were thinking maybe some intolerance or allergy or something. But so how you figure that out is McDougall's got something called the Diet for the Desperate. He wrote about a newsletter on in December of 2002, which takes like the 12 things that people most commonly are allergic to and says, just get these out of your diet. Now, if you go on a whole plant diet, like a McDougal diet or something like that, like we advocate here at PCRM or you know, Nutrition Facts, that's going to eliminate most of the problems, maybe all of them. But if you're allergic to walnuts or you're intolerant to walnuts, because the difference is the intolerance doesn't show up any tests. Blood tests, skin tests, stool tests, it won't show up. It's just intolerance. And for gluten, for instance, it's 1 in 130 is, has celiac disease, which is pretty rare. But about 4 to 5% of people are intolerant to wheat. Mm-hmm. Whether that's the wheat or the Roundup on the wheat, because they spray Roundup with... Like one, the pesticides and things like that. Yeah, but you know what they do for wheat? They spray it like a couple days before they harvest it because it increases the yield. I didn't know that. So That's even, so yeah, just double the detail stuff. You know, so if, you know, people say, well, what do you eat? And I say, well, look, first thing is get away with all the animal products because that's going to get rid of most of your pesticide loads because that's where most of it is. If that doesn't work, then we got to start looking at plant products that might cause you problems. I could send you to an allergist, but if you test negative, that doesn't help. If you test positive, some that would be helpful. We'll try that first. But for the most part, you're better off just doing the diet for the desperate. If that's hard for you to do, like in my case, it was hard to do because I was married to a foodie who likes to put a lot of different things and stuff, you know, uh, which is fine. But I went to the ultimate elimination diet, which is water. And what that does is it puts your GI tract to rest and just allows it to heal itself. Do you recommend water fasting to certain, for certain type of people? What I do as a clinician is I first try and get them to change in their home environment, pulling out all the stops on that. Mm-hmm. If they have an autoimmune disorder or something like that or blood pressure and they're not responding to that, then I think an immersion program, a residential program is, is pretty close, like McDougal, which at this point for 10 days is about... 6,200 when I was at 2 North 4th, 15 days, 9 days of water. They require you to be there for half as long as your water fast because they start feeding you slowly because the first day they give you fruit juice because your gut's been totally put to sleep. Right, so you're sort of transitioning to just water. Well, actually, they'll start your water right on day one. Oh, right away. It's transitioning coming back. Because if you take a gut that's been totally at rest and you throw a bunch of fiber at it, you're looking at some major discomfort. Oh, I understand. So okay. then you're ramping up the food. Sure. Now, they have buffet breakfast, lunch, and dinner there at, at True North. I mean, that, but they are an SOS facility. So they don't use salt, oil, or sugar. At McDougal, there's no oil in the cooking. Mm-hmm. But he recommends a little um, salt and even sugar for oatmeal and things like that. If it gets you to eat that instead of, you know, it's devil's in the details. Yeah, yeah. he's um, And right. sugar has never been, Jeff Novick says, sugar has never been shown in the literature up to 5% intake, which is 5 or 6 teaspoons a day for the average based on the caloric intake. That's never been shown to be harmful. So sugar's not the bugaboo. I mean, but everybody's looking, oh, it's sugar. You know, okay, well, I can't keep eating all the meat I want, and, you know, the shrimp and the fish and... 
what do you mean fish is a meat? You know, or sort of, you know, you get into these sort of interesting conversations with people over time. But sugar's not the problem. And salt, you're probably better off not taking salt in. Is there a certain, like, limit you recommend for salt? Because that's, like, a highly debated topic itself. Yeah, and, and actually Jeff Novick and John McDougal disagree. They argue back and forth on this. You need 500 milligrams of salt a day. There's almost no way you can get that, not get that in this society. But is that like um, even like natural sodium from, from like whole plant foods? Or yeah, is that, it's okay. a natural sodium from salt. You'll get plenty. But the average consumption in this country is about 5 to 10,000 milligrams. That's incredible. And that's coming from, I assume, all the processed crap that people are eating. Well, what's the leading source of salt in the diet? <sighs> well, uh, probably potato chips, I'm no, thinking. No, bread. Bread. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. I, mean, I, I would believe that. And, and, the right. reason, and the reason they do that is bread leads to passive overconsumption and it's salted. So they're gonna, you're going to eat more of their product. Yep. And some of it's just habit. You know, people, you know, we've learned to cook. I make pancakes. I make waffles. Uh, the waffles I make for my grandkids are not oil-free. I use canola oil, which is the better of the oils. Uh, but the grandkids love it and I eat it. You know, but I, this is like a once, yeah, twice a year thing. Right, right. You know, uh, I mean, it's not the cake on your 11 year old's birthday party when you're a type 1 diabetic that's going to kill you. You know, the people come in and would say, I remember this one patient who said, You'd be proud of me, Doc. I went to my son's 11th birthday and I didn't have a piece of his cake. And I said, What are you crazy? That's, yeah, that's what it's for. I mean, those like treats, I feel like. It's doable, you know. You can still have a healthy lifestyle without being a perfectionist. And Doug Lyle talks about that. He says, ah, I shoot for B+. Plus. I go. shoot for B+, plus, right? Right. And he talks about willpower, you know, which is a very interesting subject unto itself. Everybody's born with the same amount of willpower. Everybody wakes up every morning with the same amount of willpower. So when people fall off the, quote, wagon, it's usually late in the day when they're tired or they're hungry. But their willpower is down. So what, is it, what do you do to maintain your willpower? There's about three or four very specific rules. You eat whole plant foods so that you have a steady glucose level. They did a very disturbing study in Israel that Doug Lyle talks about. Israeli patrol, parole boards. They could predict whether you were going to get patrol, paroled or not just based on the time of day. First couple cases were 75% paroled. Right before their, they took their break in the morning, it would drop to 25%. After their break, it went up to 75%. Right before lunch, it was below 25%. After lunch, it was up. Just figure their glucose levels in their blood right. from their food. So adequate sleep. If you haven't read the book, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker, it's a very interesting tome on sleep and what we know about sleep. He's a PhD sleep guy at Berkeley, so it's a very interesting book. Uh, you want adequate regular sleep. You want to eat the right foods. You want to exercise on a regular basis. So you lay out your exercise clothes before you go to bed. And you want to clean your environment. Because if your bedroom's messy and your study's messy and your house is messy, as you go through the day, you're sort of looking at it and you're not deciding to pick it up, but it's wearing your willpower down. Right. Because you're trying to, you have to make those decisions all the time. More decisions you have to make, the lower your willpower goes. Right. So... That's willpower. And, uh, you know, we're biological systems. The funny thing is that people who are lean like you are and lean like I am now, leaner than I was, most of the people I talk to think people who are over fat are just overeaters. Nothing's farther from the truth. These people just consume a little bit more calories every day. So... A tablespoon more of oil than you need in a day is like 12 pounds in a year. A teaspoon more is like, like four pounds or three pounds or something. But over time, Covert Bailey, I don't know if you're, this is before your time, Mr. Fit or Fat. He was a low fat guy or fit. You want to be fit or fat? And he used to talk a funny talk. He, some of his jokes were a little ethnically off color, but he'd say, okay, you're 15. Nice muscles don't drive yet, you don't have a job, you don't have kids, you know, you're fit. And you get a car, and you get a job, and, you know, you start getting a little fatter. You know, your muscle's getting marbled, sort of like a good steak. 
But, you know, if you're 30, you look in the mirror and you go, yeah, no, I'm not in as good a shape as when I was 15, but not too bad. You know, at some point, it starts spilling out over into things that you don't want it to spill out to. Saddlebags, you know, love handles, you know, where, right? Sure. And it didn't happen overnight. So people, I draw a distinction in my talks, and I will tomorrow briefly. I don't have much time to go into it. But the BMI, I don't know if you know what your yeah, BMI sure. is. Yeah. you got to realize that that was invented by Adolfo Quatale in 1832. Okay, I'm not sh sure who quite that is. It's <laughs> a be Belgian mathematician. Okay. And he did, came up with the formula just to help sort of sort out the different types of people, just to describe them. And it was forgotten for the most part. But Ansel Keys, who was mm -hmm. a population biologist, yeah. in 1972 published a paper where he popularized it. We've been using it ever since. In the paper, he says it shouldn't use, be used for individuals. should never be used for individuals. Well, I know they say, like, it's inaccurate to use it on athletes, like maybe like a football player, because that's not really necessarily correlating their BMI to their uh, – Because they content. might have a lot of muscles, muscles. right? So that's, you're saying, like, it should never be used. Right. I don't use it. I mean, it's great for a population measure. I don't have any problem measuring weight on patients when they come into Kaiser Permanente if Kaiser wants to look at their population data. Right. I'm fine with that. But is it like that same type of thinking? Like Absolutely. It okay. The problem is that there's another end of the spectrum we'll talk about in a minute. But the problem is also my medical assistant's weighing people. If I ask you what your weight is, you can tell me within two pounds. Why the hell should I put you on a scale? Why don't I just ask you? Right. You tell me, write down, self-reported weight. Boom, it's accurate. But I don't need to have you take your shoes off, get on a scale, waste all these people's time sure. doing this and stuff like that. I'll put my purse down, take my coat off. I mean, that, you know, it's just waste, basically. But the BMI, which is a, a population measure, it's, it's like you said, for percent body fat. But the other end of the spectrum, and Romero, Romero did a study in 2009, it's 50% inaccurate. It misclassifies 50% of obesity. And hypermuscular obesity, which you talked about, is one of it. But a bigger segment is sarcopenic obesity, which is now called normal weight obesity. Right. It's basically older people who don't have any muscle on their body, but they're thin. So their normal weight but they have a high percent body fat. So people go, when I get talks to lay groups with my little chart pad stuff that I do, he said, well, how do I get my body fat measured? Well, you can do the DEXA scan like I did at the PCRM clinic yesterday where they do for their clinical studies and stuff where you've got your weighing underwater or the pinch test or the circumference. You know, I got all that stuff going. I said, look, I'm a practical guy. What works for you has got to be cheap, something you can do, and you can do it in your home. That's the ideal measure for me. Right. And I got one for you on percent body fat. That's called the full length mirror. Get out of the shower in the morning. And before you put clothes on, check things out. If there's things hanging around you don't like, like that, get to work. Right. When you start getting lean and you're committed and you're an athlete or something, you want to know what your percent body fat is. We've got ways to do that. But until you get to that point, don't even go there. You know, it's like a half pound to three quarters of a pound a week. Low calorie energy, when you get down to the last five or 10 pounds, we'll have a little bit of more of a discussion about exercise, uh, if you're cheating. What do you mean Doritos are not health food or, you know, you know whatever? Or uh, And then there's just individual population variability. So have you ever seen a Fijian running back? Where are they usually? On the front line, right? These people are big people. we got to think about it from a biological evolutionary standpoint, like Doug would. Um, everybody starts out on Asia, and they get pissed off at the government for some strange reason, and they get in boats and they head east, and they get to an island. Well, the scrawny types that couldn't store fat efficiently have died. Right. I don't know what they did with them, but, you know, they died. So they get to the next island. They set up a living. They get up the culture going. And they get Some people get pissed off at the government, and they go east. And they go island hopping all the way over to Hawaii. And they're pretty robust people, but they're eating the standard diet based on they have a little fish, but, you know, they, they're basically sweet potatoes and, you know, starches. All big civilizations, successful civilizations are built on starches, you know, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes. The Okinawans eat a lot of sweet potatoes, the ones that are living a long time. Right. Wheat, corn, you know, whatever. And then all of a sudden those people are living in their traditional environment and we bring in McDonald's or the standard American food or even crazier stuff what they're doing in the Marshall Islands. Boy, I saw a video on that. It's just... 
the eat these. I mean, the, there's actually a cultural thing about not walking, it's seen as a sign of poverty. But they eat this incredibly processed, like chicken fat, or uh, it's turkey fat. It's just really, and it's and they're really fat because genetically they were they got there based on being able to store fat, and you change their food environment. Well, it's, so it's a toxic food environment, toxic information environment. Great conferences like this, blogs like yours. You know, we can get some accurate information out there that people can weigh the advantages and disadvantages. But if they're on medications, they need to work with their docs. That's the good news. The bad news is they can't. Have, it's hard to find docs that know how to do this. And even within the movement. The docs are often pushing the magic nutrient or the supplement or something like that. And so you got to, you know, it's sort of a consumer beware sort of thing. Okay. Uh, because if you think about it, Tito, I mean, let's say we, you and I had a magic wish and we could wave our wand and just eliminate all chronic disease. What would the medical industry look like in this country? Okay. I mean, it, fewer hospitals, right? fewer nurses, fewer doctors. I mean, I don't know as a primary care doc how many people I could take care of. But I would be not treating hypertension, diabetes, and a lot of stuff. I'd be treating more ankle sprains because people would be healthier. They'd be out doing more. Probably less infections, but I'd probably see, still see some infections. People get infected. Right. You know, I would have to change my whole skill set or even something like mammography, which probably even shouldn't be done on the population level. So as far as supplements, the only supplement really you right. need is vitamin B12. Iodine is a possibility if you're in the Midwest because mm -hmm. the soils are iodine depleted. That's where the goiters, Colorado, that led to the iodization of salt. But reality in this country, you're going to get some salt exposure, and most of that salt has iodine. The specialty salts don't. So sea salt and stuff like that don't Yeah, like iodine. the more natural type salts. Yeah. And then there's the old vitamin D thing. I always thought to myself, you know, I know vitamin D is helpful, but it's got to do something besides the whole calcium thing. And what it does, and there's a dermatology thing that really showed that when you get sun exposure to your skin, it liberates nitrites and nitrosamines from the subcutaneous tissue that then go into your bloodstream and lower your, improve your arterial function. So sunlight actually lowers your blood pressure. That's amazing. So in addition to the immune functions, it's healthy arterial disease. So uh, what people say, well, how should I get vitamin D? I said, well, you know... If you're having symptoms like muscular weakness or something's going on and you want to try a supplement, you know, two to 3,000 a day or 5,000 every other day, get you up over 30, we'll see how you feel. But the healthiest way to get it is 30 minutes of sun exposure a day. Right. It'll help your sleep, you get your arterial benefit, which you won't get out of the oral vitamin D. It's amazing how many people use personal care products, you know. You know, do you need to shower every day? Do you really need to shave every day? Well, you and I have beards, so, you know, but do you really need to shave? I mean, at a conference like right. this, of course we do. But at home, really? I mean, you know, I mean, they know what you look like. Well, thankfully, there's a lot of natural products coming out without aluminum. That's um, right. And many of them are cruelty-free and vegan. And Absolutely. Like all around, just better products. But That's why organic is better, but isn't critical. I mean, since most of the organic, persistent organic pollutants come in through the animal products and, mm -hmm. and the concentration in the animal lines. Right. You know, just going non-organic is probably good. There are certain fruits and vegetables that are more heavily pesticide used than others, and you want to avoid those. But, you know, washing stuff is usually a good idea. Uh, I actually only drink distilled water unless I'm away from home and I haven't controlled that. So here again, they sometimes add aluminum in water processing plants. So you just don't know. And, and you can... Write to your water company and find out what they have in their water when it goes out of their plant, but that doesn't tell you what comes out of your tap. I use uh, water distillation. Okay. It's a pure water, makes three liters of water a day, a little electric. Right. But I, there, uh, True North has a, a link to an article that Goldhammer wrote about the different options. This does this, this is good for this, this is good for this. And they, At True North, it's distilled water. They have large distillers there. Um, but at home, this is just a little pure water mm -hmm. sort of thing. You know, it costs six hundred dollars, but I've been using it for a year now, and I just make it every night. You know, I just plug it in so the electricity is overnight where it's low, low cost, and just in the morning we got three liters of water. You know, and I just put some of it in a 
container to put in the refrigerator and one in a pitcher to stay on the counter because my wife doesn't like cold water. She's cold sensitive teeth, so you okay. know, him and hers sort of thing. <laughs> right, right. Going. And uh, so the neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and stuff are the sort of thing that it may be more prevention than cure. And once, you know, it's hard to reverse, although I was excited to see that Ornish talked about a study they're doing about reversing cognitive impairment based on diet. They just started it. I asked him when that article is going to be out. He said they just started it, so it's going to be about a year or two probably. Right. But there's no downside to doing this. I mean, it's like Michael Greger says. I mean, that's the downside to eating kale, a little green stuff cut between your teeth. I mean, really? I mean, you know, yeah. your fat friends saying, well, are you losing weight? Are you sick or something like that? You know, I mean, uh, Doug Lyle's done some good videos on that, how to get along without going along. And, Right. The slow, fast way he did a blog, uh, webinar for McDougal on that, which is really good. How to lose weight without losing your mind. So there are resources right. out there. PCRM is a great, great organization with a vegetarian starter kit, nutrition for kids, the Kickstarter program, uh, getting animals out of the research. So it's, you know, better for the animals, but also better for screening what we need to do, the policy issues they work on. With the USDA, when they do the food pyramid every five years, I was one of four doctors that joined the suit against them. Oh, okay. Because they picked California because the Ninth Court is, you know, more liberal or something like that. So they were looking for the California doctor. said, I'm fine. I'll join a suit against my government. What kind of lose, you know? Homeland Security's probably already got me on their watch list. I don't know, you know? So uh, it's, it's been an interesting journey. But it's much more rewarding to treat people and get them off medicine and make them healthy. It's harder to make money right. given the current reimbursement system. But... Uh, Certainly a lot healthier. Right. Well, hey, we got to um, wrap it up, Dr. Forrester. It was a real pleasure having you on. Thank you so much Thanks for your you time. Know. I'm going to have you definitely come again uh, on the show. Maybe we could do a future one via Skype, or if you're ever in the area, feel free to get in touch. Well, Sacramento's ways. I don't get out this much area. I will be back probably for my 50th college reunion okay. at Lehigh. I missed my 50th high school, but, you know, if I get back for my 60th or my 55th, what my 55th would be? That would be... 21 would be 19, 2020, <laughs> 50 years. It's a little scary when you think about it. Well, good luck and keep up the great work.